All right, guys, here's take two. Apparently the microphone was not working with the YouTube live stream, even though it showed it was. So I'm going to take a minute here and see if I can pull up the stream on my phone, see if I have sound or not. And if you can hear me, let me know here. That's a pain in the butt. Hi, can you hear me? Do you have sound? Here we go. Let's take a look. It's all cool. Here we go. Let's take a look. It's all cool. Here we go. Let's all right. Well, I'll just have to delete that other strange. Awesome. I have no idea. I didn't change a thing. It's the mighty YouTube, the YouTube. I think it's almost a tradition. If it's uh, a Sunday and it's raining, we talk about comics. And if it's a Hell or Mouse live stream, we're going to have it. Awesome. Yes, yeah, Scott. Okay, real quick, man. Scott Connor out there, man. We tried to call you, man. Give us, give me, give me a yell. Give me a call. Uh, I sent you a message or something like that. We tried to call you that day too. Um, kind of got a little worried about you there. I'm glad you're on here, man. So uh, give me a call sometime. Usually when you end up messaging me, I'm either on the, and I don't reply, I'm on the road or I'm at work. I can't, I can't do too much about it, man. But yeah, give us a call. Me and uh, Tim is a little worried there a little bit. But, you know, we know you're a big boy. All right, guys. So as you can see by the title here, there's a, I might be getting it wrong, but I've been going to this show off and on since about 2009. And recently, over the years and stuff like that, uh, that's, this is actually the first place I met Mr. Scott Conrad in person. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, you know, Anderson, you know, all these guys that I talk about and stuff, uh, the numbers vary. But this time, uh, three of us went this time. We were hoping to meet Scott there and all this stuff. But anyway, it's a comic book show in Salem, Virginia. This was their 22nd year. It's called the Virginia... Vintage, Virginia Vintage Collectible and Comic Show, I believe, and stuff like that. And I got to tell you, man, this year they had some uh, really good deals. Just, just about everything I want to show you was fifty cents to a dollar, if that. When you bought more, you got a bigger deal. You know, uh, the Haglin was actually effortless, and only th the most expensive thing I bought in here was a, a trade for three bucks and stuff. So it was a really good show. To me, it didn't look like it was that crowded, uh, but I'm starting to start seeing the same people there that I don't really talk to that I sort of started recognizing from a few of the vendors and stuff, right? So, uh, you know, like I said, these things vary. Some things I'll remember, but I'll get off, the, you know, we'll just jump right in there and stuff. And I'm probably going to be doing a video to upload to do about it quickly. You guys throw, as people come in there, throw out um, uh, questions and stuff if you want them and stuff. Yeah. Oh, well, Mr. Bird, too bad I didn't see there. But today, what I was saying before when the microphone wasn't working in the stream before, today was going to be a day where I did sort of an old, I was going to do an old school Howler Mouse video where I really went into detail, maybe a little bit of history and stuff about an Alan Moore retrospective. A couple weeks ago, probably about two weeks ago, uh, somebody on Twitter tagged me and it was I kind of got a kick out of it there's a bit of a compliment and a little bit of a passive aggressive hurry up and do this Alan Moore um an Alan Moore video where he's you know kind of talk about his career and his books and stuff and I've got tons of his stuff up here I've got short boxes of his stuff here and stuff on the shelves but uh I kind of stopped doing those videos you know that's what made my channel and stuff like that because people were just ripping me off all the way around and you can't win if you talk about it or say things you get accused of this being bitter and it hurts you in the long run. But it was so bad that I actually had other channels tell me about this dude in Florida who was using my videos to do an article and he was getting paid to do it. A regular article in a newspaper. It was that bad. Um, overindulged in brewskis last night. So we'll hang out as long as possible. Yeah, I hear you, kid Ragnarok. I got you. So the reason I didn't do the Alan Moore video is the fiance, we ended up in the emergency emergency room really early this, early this morning. She's fine. We're home. We were just there forever today. Went out to Texas Steakhouse, got something to eat, ended up crashing for a few hours and we're waking up and I'm just doing this to, uh, you know, kind of get a break from everything and then get back to the real world here. Over to those and Bruce, we almost got, we almost got a beer today. We thought about it, right? So the, one of the first things I got is volume one, number one of Eclipse Comics. And tell me, let me know how the reception is. I'm using the fiance's um, computer here and it's looking awesome to me. Uh, but I got Appleseed. Now, a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of anime, I'm not a huge anime expert. I like what I like. I know some of the classics, 
Uh, I kind of get into them, some things I don't like and stuff like that. But, you know, when it comes to adult movies and your anime, 80s had the best stuff, right? And this is a manga, Appleseed, that I love. It's sort of post-apocalyptic, but there were no atomic bombs that went off. The whole world just went into World War III. All these different wars went off. And, uh, you know, it's the adventures of some people in there, if you will. I would go into more detail about it, but there were, I haven't seen the anime since the 90s, and I haven't read any of these books since the 90s. But I just was like, I would see the advertisements for this and other books, and I just thought the designs were just fantastic. So there you go. This is good. There we go. Somebody, yeah, Scott out there knows Appleseed. Love it, right? Now, what was really funny about this is that there's been a flux of comic books that have turned into keys, if they will, and their value went up. Now, we're not talking about Eternals and stuff. We're talking about odd comics that I've had in my collection from for years since I got them on the stand, like She-Hulk doing the jump rope, number 43 or whatever it is, the one where she's got the beach ball uh, on the cover, and it's an ode to Demi Moore on the cover of Newsweek or something when she was naked and pregnant, odd stuff. So I started kind of looking around and comic book around with some of my books, and I got to the what if parts. Little did I know right before this, they had, at San Diego Comic Con, they announced the what if cartoon series or whatever it's going to be. I'm not real worried about it. And I noticed this was one of the books that were worth a little bit more than the rest of them. Got this for 50 cents. It's uh, What If Venom Had Possessed the Punisher, and it's by Kurt Music. And, you know, before he was huge and famous there. Uh, and then it's got one of the pencilers who I don't know him personally, but his pencils kill me. He was on Justice League Detroit and Suicide Squad. Uh, Luke McDonald, uh, a guy who must have some great visual storytelling skills, but his art just kills me. Can't stand it. So I'll flip through this and it just kind of cracked me up. Uh, this even has a $30 price tag on it. But uh, like I said, I found this for 50 cents, maybe a dollar. Maybe this is the guy that got it for a dollar. What do we got here? All right. Some of them with Art Adams covers. Okay. Definitely be looking for those. Talking about Appleseed. Only have a few issues of the Eclipse run. Yes. The guy is the creator of that is awesome. Okay. Um, hey, Tat's Comics out there. I haven't heard from you in a while, Tat. What's up? And hello in Brazil. That's right. We're all saying it. Now, some of these things I just kind of grabbed because they were there. Either I already had these or I bought them on the stand and I sold them. Uh, things like that. Some keys here, I think. They're all here together. But I grabbed these for a dollar. And I got this one because I'm curious. This you know, usually seems like collectors want the UPC box on this. You know, the new stand edition. Uh, this one is a direct edition. And it's got the M for Marvel. And uh, I still have the one I bought, the X Factor number one that I bought off the stand, right? I still have the same one and stuff, right? Well, here's the number one that's a direct edition. And I noticed that it was $24.99 for some reason. So I kind of grabbed it just wondering why this bumped up all of a sudden. But, you know, it was a buck at the show and stuff, right? Now, X Factor was sort of exciting at the time um, because, um, you know, you had this buildup of the return of Jean Grey uh, after they said they wouldn't do it. Jim Shooter said they would not bring that back Jean Grey unless somebody had an outstanding story to bring her back, a good reason, something that's not cheesy. And of all people, it ended up being a guy named Kurt Busiak who came up with a way to bring Jean Grey back, You know, even though he had nothing to do with the book. Um, this book really didn't take off, in my opinion. I mean, it was, it was hot there for a while, but they disguised themselves as mutant hunters to find other mutants and bring them to the X-Factor complex to train them and stuff. But they look like Ghostbusters walking around. Jackson Geist did the uh, art in it. I think Bob Layton was writing it. Louise Simonson and then eventually Walt Simonson came on the book and it felt like it was part of the Marvel universe, the mutant universe in the Marvel world there for a while and stuff. But still a fun book, very nostalgic. Try to throw us like West Coast Avengers number one and stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. I bet we, you, you prop William Bird said that he bought X Factor number one for a dollar yesterday too. You probably got the uh, the one I left behind because it was a new stand edition and it probably had nineteen ninety nine on it or something like that. Now this I bought off the stands. I was really excited about this when they announced this book when it came out. And I'm not going to lie, right off the bat, Walt Simonson Simonson Simonson's uh, artwork on Wolverine really threw me off at the time. And I was like, oh, no, this may not be what I'm going to do. But we all know Marvel Comics Presents. And this is number one. And it was an anthology series that was coming out every week. So I was like all excited. Like, that's going to be cool. More comics for a buck for, you know, series going on. 
And the first thing they did is like this, this cover kind of threw me off. Cause I was like, that's an awful Wolverine. Look at that mask, you know? And I got in there and it was Chris Claremont, John Mishima doing Wolverine, but he wasn't Wolverine. He was patching Mandapore and he was getting his butt handed to him by, like a, you know, some little kid like tripped him up and put him in a mud puddle and he laughed about it. You know what I mean? It was like they dumbed down Wolverine a little bit with his skills and powers and stuff. And he had this new identity. Like he put on an eye patch, even though he's got that haircut, he's short in stature. And nobody's going to know it was him. He was in disguise. And right off the bat, I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Okay. So, yeah, but I got this. So that's one of the reasons I sold the series. I, I hung in there for a long time with this. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I think in the early days of eBay, I just went ahead and put the whole series up that I had. Uh, I'd say I probably had like the first 36 issues or something. I just let him go. Yeah, Marvel Comics, it, it's fun now. I mean, it's fun now, but back then it was all heavy and stuff. The quality of storytelling in a lot of comics was so up there that this stood out, in my opinion. And, you know, it kind of felt rushed they can get it out and stuff, but it was fun. Uh, and now with the way comics are, man, the stuff's gold. So keep getting it. Now I have number one of this somewhere, and of course I have put it up. And uh, hopefully it's in my Batman box if I can find it. I, I sold a bunch of Batman books a couple years ago to make space and things like that. But I always was kind of curious about this. But like I said, it, it, this was going back to the 80s. Now, I want to say these were a bucket piece, right? But I've had number one forever. This ties into Batman year one. It was uh, Catwoman with her own miniseries. I've got two, three, and four. So finally it's complete. Uh, and hopefully this is a fun issue. And it's written by Mindy Newell with J.J. Birch and Mike Bear Art. So even if the story is kind of weak, let me get that glare off of there. Uh, the artwork is going to deliver. Mike Bear is one of my favorite artists. Um, and he's he's really cool, man. I got some. Uh, I think the first place I saw was Infinity Incorporated. Uh, but he's, he's an underrated artist that's really good. So we got two, three, and four of that. And like I said, I think this is the series that ties into Batman Year One, if I remember right. Maybe not. If not, no big deal. They had another Catwoman miniseries out, and I, I'll, you know, suggested for mature readers, so that's cool. Now, this I found, which was really cool, and the guy honored it. I found this in a 50-cent box, and when I went behind the guy's, um, he let me come in the back. You know, he had his table, and I got to come behind the table, and he had some other books he was he prices as you buy them because they're key books. He had four or five of these and I don't always want to charge for them, but he honored the 50 cents on this. This came out in 1992, 94. I had it right in my head the first time, 1994. But it's a uh, death uh, talks about life. It's real thin. It's just a few pages. It's been reprinted in a death. Um, uh, you know, trade over there with one of her mini series. But John Constantine pops up and it's death talking to you about how to use a condom. You know, it's a PSA book, right? It's on there and stuff. It's got a little bit of a humor for such a heavy subject. And it was really cool uh, at the time. You know what I mean? This is when you still felt like you were part of a community and they talked to you and didn't lecture you. And it was so funny because you get the idea that she's going to show you how to use a condom with John Constantine. And he looks around. And he's all suspicious. He looks away and he whips out a banana to give her. And, you know, I mean, it was it was really funny. They pulled it off really well. What we got going at? Hey, Gretzky's out there. What's up, man? Uh, moving on here. Just not a lot to say about this, but uh, Usagi Yojimbo. Uh, we got a little story here where he had a mini series where it was Space Usagi. I never really find this. I have number one of this. It's a mini series through Dark Horse. That means I just have to get number three, and I have them all. And I have the first one signed by Steve Sakai. Um, Steve Sakai is just, it seems like, you know, it's it's astounding how long he's been around when you really think about it. He started, I've got Guru Comics, he was a letterer for, and he kind of went from there. Hey, Tim, tell me, you have a what if number 10 in your collection? First Jane Foster Thor, Specular's going nuts for it now. Studio Fitness, I think it's Louie. Um, I've had it before. I don't know if I still have it. I honestly doubt it. Actually, I just boxed all my what ifs. Um, I've had it. And it didn't blow me away. It was just sort of a what if comic, you know, you never thought would be worth anything. Um, so if I do have it, it's in such bad shape because I think I remember buying that thing like uh, in eighth grade, you know, it's a long time ago. And yeah, I know we, people were talking about it and stuff. Um, the only book I really saw that people were pushing was the Thor number one that came out that Jason Aaron did, uh, you know, so yeah, you know. I'm not real worried about that one, but no, I don't have it. It's it's funny though. It's funny. 
Uh, cool. All right, man. Now, I about fell down when I saw these for 50 cents. And last year, I had a bit of a... Uh, con boy, my conscience kind of got to me last year when I found that Shazam book, uh, number 28 or whatever it was, which was the first appearance of uh, Black Adam in the Bronze Age. It's like a $300 book, I think, and I found it for two bucks. So when I saw these, the guy who I was talking to was really cool. I was going through his 50 cent boxes. He was very nice to me and stuff. And I don't mean like kissing my butt. He just seems like a you know really cool guy. You know what I mean? And I showed to these, I said, are you sure these should be in the 50 cent box? He said, yeah, I put them in there for kind of make it fun and stuff. But I found a whole bunch of preacher books for 50 cents. Yeah, and I have most of these, but I mean, I'm not going to pass up preacher books for 50 cents down the line. Maybe I can trade these off or something. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure I do have all of these. I love that cover. These Glenn Farby covers are just fantastic. And what can we say about a preacher that, you know, has already been said? I know the TV show has really people either love it or hate it and stuff, but I want to be watching the boys on Amazon prime. I found out you get the 30 first 30 days uh, free for a trial. So that means I'm going to be watching the tick TV show, which I know they've canceled. And then I'll be watching the boys and stuff. Uh, uh, so far I have heard zero people, you know, zero people, um uh, have told me that uh the boys is a bad show everybody is digging it prime is worth it gotcha man gotcha all right so i might have gotten i might have double dipped but that's okay because i know these earlier issues were hard to get but boom studios make sure i'm telling you the right one yeah boom studios a few years ago came out with this series that was actually acclaimed this is philip k dix do androids uh dream of electric sheep and this is essentially what Blade Runner was based on. But what Boom Studios did is they took the novel and they're actually using uh, the narration and stuff in the novel over the panels with the dialogue and things like that. And they're telling the novel. OK, this is this is a this is a pure adaptation of the Philip K. Dick novel. And, uh, you know, some of these, I think one or two of these might be worth a little bit of money, but uh, they're really hard to find in the wild. And I was amazed they weren't on my list. So I have a stack here. I've got to find to see how many of these I have now. These were really fun. I'm a huge Blade Runner fan. And Rutger Hauer has passed away, which makes his scene in Blade Runner, the tears and rain speech that he came up with, mean a lot more. Uh, kind of there when Swayze died and when you watch a ghost now, it's really odd when you see him walk away for the last time. Garth Ennis's take on superheroes is like a funny joke that was retold a hundred times. Paulo Costa is there. Studio Fitness says, oh, I got a bunch of people saying uh, the voice is good. Yeah, Paulo. Well, the trick is, is that Garth Ennis secretly, not secretly, he, he hates superheroes. He hates them. And I think part of the, even though he kept it light with a black comedy feel to it and stuff, he's pointing out some of the hypocrisy of the superheroes and stuff, you know. Yeah, funny jokes. Is, to be honest, yeah. Oh, I get it. Garth Ennis's take on superheroes is like a funny joke that's told a hundred times. Yeah, but I, I, I think it's funny. I got issue one and three of the Golden Age miniseries for fifty cents a piece. It's funny you say that because I did too. <laughs> uh, Gretzky, uh, the Golden Age here. This is probably my. This is this could be my third to fifth copy of number one. Uh, this is one of those books. If I find any of the issues super cheap, I will buy them. Um, you know, I've, I found this at Ollie's, the hardback edition. I remember buying all four issues in 1994 when I was on an Essions Pass or was it Bivouac? Essions Pass in the military uh, and mailed them back to my grandmother's house so I could read them, you know, with a bunch of other comics and stuff. Absolutely fell in love with James Robinson's story. Uh, if you watch my channel, you know I can just gush over this. Uh, and to me, issue four has one of the best choreographed storytelling, sequential art fight scenes ever. Paul Smith has a history in animation, and it paid off in this, man. I can't recommend Golden Age enough. My favorite, there's several storylines going on with this, with this, with these heroes. This like, you know, uh, but my favorite one is the Manhunter. Uh, that's in this. Uh, I was ready for James Robinson to do a Manhunter series exactly like he did on this. And of course, this book, uh, even though it's supposed to be an Elseworlds, he pulled some of the Starman history into his Jack Knight Starman series of the 90s. 
What is this? Uh, the Golden Age was just stuff. I consider it the first Reconstructionist book of the 90s. Was great stuff. Was great stuff, is what Paulo said. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I fell absolutely in love with it. Um, one of the books I'm kind of getting, I had this series, and of course I sold it. And now, um, you know, I've got all kinds of things. Battle of the Planet coloring book I found. Uh, I found my Princess uh, Toy Fair exclusive figure that I bought back. Uh, where I sold it a few years ago and stuff like that. I've got uh, one of the volumes of the original Space Ninja Gachamon. But, of course, Battle of the Planets is what we had in America in the late 70s. I would get up in, in 1977, 78. I would get up at 6 in the morning on Saturday mornings and watch Battle of the Planets and Johnny Quest. And there was some cartoon I watched also, and then I'm thinking about it, where a dude floated around in a balloon, a hot air balloon, and he talked to the animals. But it wasn't like Dr. Doolittle. It'll come to me. I think it was a British cartoon. But anyway, uh, Battle of the Planets was just an amazing thing. And there is talk of the guys who did Endgame are going to be finally, we're finally going to get a real live action movie of this. I think there was one made in Japan. I've seen a trailer for it. And I, and it, I really couldn't tell if it was an actual film or if it was like just some really expensive cosplay, you know. So I cannot wait to see what they do with this. I'm one of the few people that like the Speed Racer cartoon, you know, or movie that came out, you know. Willie Fogg. That might have been it. I'll look it up. I'll, that that could have been the cartoon. Hey, Sergeant Bass is up there showing some comic books. We're just chugging along, completing my Legion of Superheroes run. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I have seen, finally, I've, like everybody else, I have finally seen the pictures of the Legion of Superheroes that Bendis is coming out with Ryan Souk and stuff. And I don't know if I'm down for it. I'm going to give it a chance because I'm a Legion fan and I'm no, I've already gotten in my mind. I'm going to be disappointed. It's a case of that's not the Legion of superheroes. You could have just took what you came up with and made a whole new team and a whole new book. You know what I mean? There is really no reason to replace the Legion of superheroes. Who's been around for 60 years now. You know what I mean? So I'm kind of already going in like we've been seeing this crap for five years. Let's see what's going to happen. But I saw some of the redesigns and some of the things that they've done. And I'm like, this is a completely different team. You could have started a whole new book and not called it Legion of Superheroes. Um, that's what kills me. You know, you come up with all these ideas and redesigns and, and things like that. And you could put that into new stuff and make a new key book and have it take off. You know, I would rather have a legion of superheroes then a book i'm going to be reading going this isn't the legion of superheroes what are they calling it the legion of superheroes it, it just you know not worth it anyway here's issue number 44 you know of the paul levitt's uh run back in uh you know the 80s and stuff really good stuff i'm really close to completing this you know uh 50 cents for that and then um a series that i hate that i didn't pick up back in the day like I said, there wasn't really a comic book shop around here. You had to go to Bristol and I was traveling and all this other stuff. You know, I was getting Sandman and a few other little Vertigo books here and there. But this is when Vertigo was really new. You know what I mean? But uh, it's Sandman Mystery Theater by Matt Wagner and Ga Matt Wagner and Guy Davis. And I'm sure there's somebody else helping write this book. But, uh, man, this thing is this turned out to be Steve Siegel guy and Guy Davis. And I know Matt Wagner was on the book for a while, right? But it's a Sandman Mystery Theater. Uh, it's where we get our Sandman of the 30s and 40s here. And we get this big pulp feel, uh, pulp stories. You know what I mean? Uh, he takes on cults and things and still, you know, still villains and stuff. And it's got uh, the tone of it is very adult. It's taken, and it brought up issues like racism of the 30s and stuff. I mean, you walk through this and you kind of feel like you're there. And Guy Davis's art is just fantastic. So kind of working on getting the run. This one, we had the Hour Man. You know, I think this thing might have ran for like 75 issues or something. I'll have to look it up. Hey, John Jones is out there. Cool. I'll be reading some comments here. Let me show these. And I feel like I have a few of these. I might have double dipped. I keep I seem to keep buying the same issues over and over if I don't watch. But I love the feel of this. That old, you know, but it's more of a pulp read than, you know, the, in the ideal of like the shadow and things like that. And then it is a superhero tale. Really slide piece of slice of life thing, you know, during the depression. Okay, Studio Fitness. In the UK, it is almost rare to go get back issues at a convention. You have no idea how lucky you are to be able to grab books like Preacher for 50 cents. It's a rare thing to buy fine comics that cheap. With the era of speculation and everybody hunting for things, 
you really need to, in my opinion, you really need to stick to things that you like and actually do want to read than going out and trying to find keys and stuff. And I found something really, well, I didn't find it, but I have a little story here when I get to it that was really cool what we found. I wish DC would do a Sandman Mystery Theater Absolute Edition. Uh, from what I'm reading, it definitely deserves it. John Jones is out there. What's up, brother? Just got a full run of Garth Ennis's Hitman. Looking forward to reading it. I love it. I love him, man. I'm down to five issues. I need five issues, and I'll have the full run. So congratulations to you. I may just start going ahead and finishing off. I've done this before. You know, I've gotten to the point where I've gotten that low and want to just get online and finish my runs. But Garth Ennis's Hitman, I, I had a blast with it. I really did. You know, for him to do a book like that set in the uh, DC universe in Gotham City and stuff has a real Butch Cassidy and uh, Sundance Kid kind of feel with it a little bit. Um, I love the series, man. So congratulations. I hope you enjoy it. OK, so um, I got a little secret origins. This is another series I'm going to be uh, completing. There's only 50 issues and I'm so close to having I figure why not. But we get in here and we have like. Uh, they had a. Uh, they had three issues where they just focused on the Justice League. Keith Giffen's specifically, I think the Giffen, um, the Mantis McGuire era. If you, you know, so we get Mister Miracle in this, and it had Don Heck in it. Now, if you don't know who Don Heck is, Don Heck is uh, one of the first guys to draw. I think the Avengers and stuff in the Silver Age of Marvel. He was, you know, and he ended up being at Valiant. So here we are in the '80s, and Don Heck is doing a DC book. Now, I'm pretty sure now that I'm thinking about it, that he may have done some other DC books, but I thought it was really interesting to have one, you know, Don Heck on a DC book that was like a contradiction to me. I'm like, whoa. And I think that's really about it on this one. Uh, of course, we have Jared Jones on a book, and we just will not talk about him ever again. And you can look up why. So what we got here. I missed out on the Hitman trade paperbacks when they finally reprinted it, and is always very interested. That's when the Garthina the Supero jokes were funny. <laughs> that was the first time he came around telling the jokes, right? And a few things I got here. I'm a huge fan of Sword of the Atom. Okay, Sword of the Atom is where we got the uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs take a little bit um, with a wink and a nod on the Atom where he crashed in the, uh, in the uh, Amazon you know, jungle. And uh, he ended up getting some barbarian garb on him because... There was a alien race of six inch people who had crashed there years ago and they've forgotten their own technology and went kind of back to barbarian ways, if you will. And I'm taking those Sword of the Atom books and stuff and I'm going to be bounding them. I finally decided what I was going to bound. I'm going to do Sword of the Atom, the three specials that came out, uh, two or three other books, and these are them. I already have this, but this is going to be specifically to be bound. This is Secret Origins with the Atom in it. Um, and then he had a series that Roger Stern started up and Graham Nolan came on. And the last two issues, uh, who did these? Uh, Tom Pyre came on. And we kind of got, like, had the last two issues sort of close of the book on the power of the atom. He had to leave the, you know, one of the last times he found the village again, as you know, that he was in the Brazil, it kind of got blown up. And I think he found out the CIA did it. And he goes after the guy that did it, that ordered it through the CIA to make him come back and be an operative form. Very cloak and daggerish, if you will, you know. So uh, yeah, this is 17 and 18, the end of the series. Yeah, Sword of Adam was fun. I think Don Heck did a few of DC Mystery Comics in the 80s. I, that's what I'm saying now that I'm thinking about it. Um, I'm, I'm sure he did some other books, Don Heck. But uh, like I said, in my mind, he's a moral guy. That's what's wild, you know. Let's see what we got here. I'm getting, we're about halfway through the stack with, with me. Did an upgrade. I talked about Batman the Outsider, Outsiders again. Years ago, I did a, a, a Batman the Outsiders video, not so much about Batman and the Outsiders, but about how much they influenced everything. You know, Marvel Wolfman, Brad Meltzer, uh, some things that popped up. And it had, uh, this was a comic here. This this issue here specifically, I have wore them out, read them and reread them. I was 10 years old when Batman the Outsider started, and I thought it was going to be my Batman book that I was going to follow for the rest of my life. Like, I'm going to buy this off the stand, you know, for decades, like some people have been doing Fantastic Four and things like that. And it crossed over with the Titans, and Afro and Perez came on there and did a two. This goes with another Teen Titans comic where the comics go together. 
Uh, I just needed an upgrade on it. It's a beautiful cover when you put them together. You know, Batman the Outsiders was a fun read. It was actually the third number one Batman book ever at the time. There had never been, you know, that many number ones. Uh, I picked up all the Sword of the Atom issues cheap a few years ago and packed away without reading. I need to dig those out. I love them. I mean, that's just it. They're, they're of their time. And I did a video years ago. You can probably put Howler Mouse Sword of the Atom if it's still there. And I talk about how they changed everything through story. To me, Sword of the Atom is the exact way that you revamp your universe. You could use you could use it as a blueprint on how to update and revamp your heroes through story. You know, everything is the same, but it's different, you know. Uh, Don Heck uh, do still the didn't Heck do still the indestructible man? You know I got one or two issues of that up there. I need to go see if he did do it. Good call, Jared Osborne. Yeah, going back to the Bronze Age there. Um, yeah, cool. I bet he did. I'm gonna have to look up his stuff now. Now, one of the things I've been doing over the last year is I've been picking up books that came out in the '80s, and the only place I would see them would be advertised like an epic illustrated magazine. Uh, maybe I'd get uh, somebody would have a book and I would see ads for them because these were direct market books. Uh, you could get epic illustrated on the magazine rack, like right there with your heavy metal and stuff like that. And Omni, uh, things like that. Uh, 1984 going way back. And they turned that to 1994. But anyway, I would see these ads sometimes. And I've looked up, I've been running across them just to see them, right? And one of the ads um, that I'm talking about, because I'll start with Moon Shadow, by the way. I got the Moon Shadow series at an antique shop, and that's what got me started. But the one I always wanted to read was Black Dragon. A six-issue series, Chris Claremont wrote it, uh, John Bolton did the art and things like that. So I've ended up, uh, whenever I see these epic books that I remember the advertisements for, I'm not going after epic you know, comics. You know, it's an offshoot of Marvel that Archie Goodwin edited and stuff. But I'm getting these things I wanted to read when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old. Uh, so I have number three, The Black Dragon, that completes the series. Got that for 50 cents. So I'm looking forward to reading this to see what this is all about. Yeah, Omni Magazine, uh, Black Dragon is good stuff. They should do a compilation of material called Aw Heck. There's Scott going, man. It's awesome. Marvel needs to reprint the last Galactus story and let John Byrne do the art to finish it from Epic. John Jones, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but one of the things I got, I don't know how many issues these ran, but these were 50 cents a piece. And Butch Geis, I will buy his stuff all day long. He is one of those guys who, to me, um, he kind of transitioned you know, from the 80s into the 90s and still got work and he had a style that didn't get dated if you will to me jackson geis is one of those guys who was able to survive the big image you know artist of the day if you will you know what i'm saying i've seen the um, mountain empire comics had an original pencil drawing sketch drawing that he had done for the guy who owns mountain empire comics that i can remember going all the way back to like 1989 and that's why he's always stuck in my mind. I was like, this guy's an artist in my idea. You know what I'm saying? But this is sort of the swashbuckler. And the guy who I uh, bought this off of, you know, he was a real nice guy. Same guy I got the preacher books off of. He said these have been selling out of the blue. Now, I've seen that they've been uh, launched again or something. Or I don't know. I haven't really followed the news. But, uh, yeah, he said the first couple issues that I have in my hand have been selling, at least in the back issue market at cons and stuff, right? So, uh, like I said, I saw these advertised for years. So now I'm going to get to see what, what this is all about. I mean, I love these. The thing about these epic books is even though this was like, um, you know, Marvel's Marvel's way of like letting creators keep the rights to their um, creations here and stuff like that. They, they really feel very 80s, you know, what we got here. Um, and now the Glass Galactus story that John Jones is bringing up was an epic illustrated magazine, and it was fantastic. Burn gun there, and we were getting shot with some heavy stories. It was the Last Galactus story. It was way in the future, and it didn't get finished because Epic was canceled. But you can find it online in script form. And I think I've seen some pages on John Byrne Robotics and stuff of where it was going. And I've never figured out how it is. They never finished that anywhere, uh, Marvel. I mean, that's that's gold. I don't know what it would be now, but I'm like the turn of the century, uh, at least 15 years ago or something, it would have been gold to just come out with a trade of that with the finished work by Byrne. It had been fantastic. 
Uh, Jan, uh, Franco says, I love Epic. Jesus Franco says, I love Epic. Akira, Alien Legion, Stray Toasters. Alien Legion is something I'm very curious about. I'm seeing them everywhere. I've got one issue, which is like an oversized special or something. And I'm afraid if I read it, I'm going to feel like I missed the boat. I need to get around to reading that. Akira, that's classic stuff. Um, Sword of the Swashbucklers is a 12 issue and a Marvel graphic novel. The Marvel graphic novel. Yes. If I, that that brings it all back right there. Thanks, man. Thanks, Paulo. I think the first Butch Geist work I ever saw were, was a Micronauts issue. I tell you what, man. There needs to be more people doing retrospectives on that Micronauts. The both the two Micronauts uh, series that came out in the late seventies, eighties, because that thing is fondly remembered. Mike Golden. Now we got Butch Geist, Pat Broderick. Bill Mantelo was on there. Um, you know, I mean, that that series is just beloved, and people reference it in ROM all the time. I just got the Swords of the Swashbuckers collection from a used bookstore cheap. Awesome. John Romita once told me, this is Jared Osborne. He worked at the Marvel Bullpen, I think, uh, back in the 90s. I mean, he worked at Marvel. But I'm, you know, uh, go check out Jared Osborne's channel, man. He's uh this is this is the this is the guy that's knowledgeable there. John Romita once told me that he thought Don Heck was much better when the original was drawn bigger at twice up rather than modern as of the mid sixties. One point five times up is sixteen by twenty as opposed to ten by fifteen. Jared, I am so glad you put it in those terms. I understand those. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, yes. So Don Heck, okay. I'm, I could go off on that. I could. I could. I'm ready to talk about that, but oh, I got a few more books to do here. Uh, do you remember Piranha Press? Kind of before Vertigo, I think. Beautiful Stories for Ugly Children. Yeah, the first Piranha Press book I got was a Dennis Cohen drawn. I can't remember who wrote it. Prince book. The musician Prince. Uh, Piranha Press. I've got a few books by them, and I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think they're the guys that did like the big book of urban legends and the big book stuff, I think. But yeah, I definitely remember Piranha Press. Um, I might dig through my shelves there and see what I have. I've got at least Piranha Press um, was interesting because when they uh, nobody, well, I didn't, and nobody that I knew um, knew that it was a DC. It branched off from DC. It was DC owned. Nobody knew. Uh, oh, thanks, Gene. Hey, Gene Paul Ace Peters out there, man. And OG is out there of the com old comic community. Um, hell yeah, Manto's writing was, was, I think, one of his best. I'm definitely coming around to the Bill Mantlo stuff. I'm definitely coming around to it, man. The guy, um, you know, to me, the guy was one of those, uh, in my, what I saw is that he was dependable. If you needed a comic out and a solid story, a comic book story, it was him. I didn't really think he was innovative. Now I'm looking back and what turned me on off of him was uh, I think he wrote uh, Alpha Flight 50 where they turned North Star and Aurora into fairies or something. They were descended of fairies, not mutants. And that's kind of like switched me off of him, man. But, um, you know, that's one comic I did. I didn't agree with. Uh, I've read some of his. I've got a ton of Bill Mantlo stuff that I am a fan of. Uh, you know, I never disliked the guy. But to me, he was just you took him for granted. It's like a great band that you hear on the radio all the time. But it's a top 40 band radio. And then all of a sudden when they're gone, you're like, oh, man, you just had the idea they'd be around forever, you know. Studio Fitness, they can they can be hit or miss, but uh, they were a uh, precursor to Vertigo. Yep, Gregory by Bar Kempel. There you go. Yeah, Gregory, I got I've got something here of that. Yeah, yeah, Gregory from Piranha Press was excellent. Yeah, Gregory was cool. Yeah. All right. So one of the things I'm kind of getting is uh, Rick Veitch. Rick Vetch, excuse me, right? Um, he was the guy that took over Swamp Thing after Alan Moore left, right? And he was also an artist on the book. And I and he's on my, I have him on Facebook, and he is such a freaking joy uh, to have on Facebook. The things that he pulls up, original art mostly, you know, that he shows from the seventies, eighties, nineties, and stuff like that. I mean, I'll just be scrolling through Facebook, and they'll be like, he'll be talking about all sorts of things and showing the original artwork and stuff, right? And um, his Swamp Thing run really came to an abrupt end because he was working on a story where uh, Swamp Thing was kind of traveling through time, 
you know, and he's going to go back to the time of Jesus. And I think he was going to come out of the cross and he's actually shown the, some of the penciled sketch artwork he was going to use for that story before it got took off there. Right. So I'm only missing two, three issues here and there, the Rick Veitch run. Uh, now when it comes to swamp thing, I think I want to be fine with the Alan Moore run, which I have all of those and some extras and things like that. Uh, and then the, um, Rick Veitch issues. I, mean, I, I think I'm going to have a solid first hundred issues, if you will, you know, but uh, the Nancy A. Collins stuff, I know people who like it. I've read a few issues and I really need to give it a chance. Um, I don't know if I want those. So if anybody's read the Nancy A. Collins issues of Swamp Thing, let me know about it. There's people that swear by it. What we got here? Yeah, we got we got a lot of Mantlo love going on. His Cloak and Dagger miniseries is one of my favorite titles of all time. He loved it. Yep. Dug it. Uh, Rick... Which you ever one that Rick Leonardo drew? I have he signed those for me. I'm trying to think. Of, like I said, Gene Ace Paul, Gene Paul Ace Peter. For you guys that have come in uh, late here, the one of the reasons I'm doing this this show here right now is because uh, we've been in the emergency room with my fiance all day. We ate, came back, take a nap. She's doing fine, so I'm kind of loopy right now. I just wanted to kind of get these books out there. I found Mantelo solid but not spectacular. Same thing, Jared. That's what I'm saying. But Sod is actually pretty hard to find. Yeah, especially by today's standards, if I, if I have to say anything like that. Uh, a Mantelo story to me is like it's solid and dependable and stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, my thing was, is that in that era of Mantelo, you had like John Byrne, Chris Claremont, and I was coming off of Steve Gerber, kind of like, you know, forming, you know, those were kind of the guys that I was reading that I knew as writers and stuff. And you had Mantelo in there, you know. Uh, both Rick and Steve Bisset are great sources of all kinds of good stuff. Yep. Yep. Steve Bisset. I need to see if I have him on Facebook. I might have him on Instagram. I don't know. Uh, Jesus Franco. I picked up almost the whole run of Alan Moore Swamp Thing at a comics fair. A pound per issue. That is fantastic. Um, especially if you got issue 19, 20, 25, 37, some keys there. You got them. He said almost a whole run, so it's still, man. Um, Alan Moore stuff, I always wish I could go back and read it for the first time again. Uh, you know, I always wish I could read Watchmen again. I wish I could read his Swamp Thing run again for the first time. Oh, such good stuff. Uh, like Mantlo, except on Alpha Flight. Thank you. I, I, you know, I don't think it was his fault that his Alpha Flight might have been weak because I think his Hulk stuff was really good. Uh, Magnola. Mike McNola and uh, Bantelow switched books with uh, John Byrne. That's how he ended up on Alpha Flight. Mantelow and McNola came off of Hulk. And they took over Alpha Flight, and John Byrne took over uh, the Hulk book. That was kind of funny back then. Like Mantelow, except on Alpha Flight, Harlan Ellison sure got pissed at him, though, for ripping him off on a Hulk issue. Oh, I didn't know about that, Mr. Bird. I did not know about that at all. Looks like I have some homework to do. Um, amongst other things, they got Harlan on the Marvel comp list for life. Oh, okay. Here we go. Now, one of the things I picked up, I may have already had this and I should have put this with some other books. I hope I do have everything here. They're not exactly organized here. I got some good stuff coming up, man. But anyway, like we're going back to the eighties and these mini series that are coming out. Uh, this was totally new. I mean, I really wish a lot of people could have been back in the 80s when the uh, the concept of the miniseries was really starting to pick up. And you were getting these oddball characters that just it just sounded weird for them to have their own title. You know, they were they were uh, part of a team and defenders or, you know, it, it seems like they were all they always should have been supporting characters and they were making them a lead. And you were like, well, what would you do with that? Where would you go? But the good thing about this Gargoyle, Gargoyle miniseries is it has Bernie Wrightston covers. And I hope that's showing up. And I always love these 80s covers because they have like these dark colors, these earthy colors. There's a texture to them. Sinkovich is another guy. Whoever did the uh, Christar, the, uh, oh man, what was it? Christar, I don't know. There was books I could pull out where they, they were sort of painted covers and stuff. And they scream 80s when you see them. They're so perfect. So, you know, some Bernie Wrights and stuff. Now, I don't know if I have number four of this, and I didn't see it in the boxes, but I'm keeping an eye out for it. But one of the books I'm kind of trying to complete was only like nine issues. 
and it's Pirates of Dark Water from the early 90s. And some of those have Charles Vest covers, right? So Hook, a movie that I saw in the theaters, and I'm a Robin Williams fan, so I can find something cool about it when I read it. Don't get me wrong, you know, but um, I totally got these for the Char great Charles Vest uh, covers. Uh, Hook was the adapt movie adaptation was four issues. I don't know if they had a magazine size where it was one volume or not, but I'm not real worried about it because we had these great uh, Charles Vest covers. It seems like there's some Charles Vest covers uh, from 90 to about 91 or 92 that you need to do a little digging because like uh, the, the one or two issues of Pirates of Darkwater he did, they're, they're great covers just to have on their own and stuff, right? Um, you know, so there you go. Oh man, we got things picking up here. Uh, reading Alan Moore Swamp Thing as it was coming out was mind blowing, especially the early issues in the 20s. Yeah, yeah, uh, I absolutely agree. They were still on the newsstand and it was cracking me up, not cracking me up, but I could feel it was getting very taboo. I felt like it was going to be caught at any moment. You know what I mean? I felt like the DC was about to get in trouble because it, it lasted up until at least crisis on the newsstand. Uh, without the, uh, they took the code off, you know, the comic code authority, they took it off. And I knew enough about comics to where the idea was, is that was just forbidden to have it on a newsstand if it didn't have that comics code authority, you know. Um, love the cartoon story called Hero for a Day. Can't remember which issue of Hulk, 280, something like that. I'll, I'll, I'm going to look that up. That's you know, Harlan Ellison was a rare case of science fiction writer that understood comics well enough. Unfortunately, he never did many comics. Where's Scott Connor at? Uh, he, he, he needs to talk about Harlan Nelson, Ray Bradbury, because I might be getting this story mixed up. I want to tell in a minute. Crystar, the Crystal Warrior. Thank you. That was it. Those covers were fantastic. I love them. And apparently Glenn Danzing liked one of the covers, too. He did an entire series of adaptations of his own work for Dark. I remember if it's Harlan Nelson, Ray Bradbury. But anyway, AC Comics adapted some of his stories. And he just got on the phone, called up the publisher there, um, and they were just talking about comics and how much he liked it and stuff. And at the end of it, he went, oh, by the way, you forgot to send me my money for my story. That'll be 150 bucks. He's like, oh, we must have had a clerical error. So that's why EC Comics started adapting his work and would just send him 150 bucks. Nelson, Ray Bradbury, and all those things. I've tried to talk Scott into doing a podcast or some videos or anything. Uh, his knowledge, if you talk to him in person, is astounding. Astounding. The things that he can cover are things that I might have a broad knowledge on, and he goes deep. Ergonis, I mean, I can, the few talks I've had with old Mr. Connor there, I can go on and on and on about. I grabbed this. I've already had this. I got zero hour off of uh, the stands when it came out, but I grabbed this. It's an extra number one because this is the first appearance of Jack Knight Starman. You know, they had the whole series there and it was what it was. It led, you know, it, it meant, yeah, the crisis in time. The concept of this is Christ my infinite earth actually wasn't over because space was fixed, but they didn't fix time. And it's, yeah, we'll move on. Now, something I experimented on here, uh, I'm seeing these all over the place. I've been seeing them all over the place, along with Orion, you know, A R I O N, you know, and all this stuff, right? There's some books that came out in the early 80s and stuff that actually ended up lasting quite a bit. And I sort of put them with the Warlord if I was going to put them in a category, you know what I mean? But it's A Rock, Son of Thunder by Roy Thomas. And this is number six. I just picked this one to go ahead and read it and to check it out. Because from what I, I remember, there was an Arak toy that came out with uh, the Warlord, the Hercules, Demos, and stuff. And they just kind of had it, you know. I saw the advertisements for Arak. It was a Roy Thomas comic, but I was reading All Star Squadron and starting with like issue number eight or something like that. Um, but I'm finally, I'm seeing these all over the place. Uh, I'm not seeing a number one in a lot of places anymore like I used to. So I'm like, you know, I need to check this out. And he's fighting apparently a vampire in this. Now, the whole concept of Arak Son of Thunder is that Europeans never made it to North America, but Arak made it to Europe or something like that. So he's like going through Greece and Italy and, and things like that. And apparently he's in, I'm assuming by this cover, I haven't read it, but you know, I picked the, I picked the horror issue to see what we're doing here and stuff. Right. So it's a native American in Europe 
Now, in real life, he would have died of disease. Let's face it, you know, smallpox or something. I hate to be that way, but I was like, that was one of my things with my whole idea. I knew how Pocahontas had died. And I was just sort of like, even as a kid, you know. Okay. There's a there was Ray's way of being nice about that was Ray's way of being nice about the whole situation. Yeah, that's why I like the story. You know, he didn't lose his mind. He was friendly. He talked to him and he threw it in there. He gave them a back door and it, you know, it was really cool. Yeah, I had that A-Rack toy, but never any comics. Uh in the early 80s, I really wanted A-Rack to be good, but it was really dull. I still bought issues one through twenty as they came out. I was young and comics were cheap. Okay, Jared, we're in the same boat on some of the stuff I bought back then. I'm with you on that one. And thanks for telling me about ARAC. I didn't have my hopes up high, but I'm just seeing them everywhere. And it, it just finally got my curiosity. Now, here's the series, this this mini series. I've had this about four or five times to the point I have no idea what issues I have now. I've had this complete set three or four times. I will sell it. I will keep it. My problem is, is that um, with this mini series is that it's not Bernie Riston getting to be Bernie Riston until around the last issue, if I remember it, right? But it's a Jim Starlin story and I keep going back and forth with it. So I'm going to complete the set. I might need one book now. I don't know. I'm going to have to look. Like I said, I've had it so many times. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to keep it because I keep finding it. Luckily, these were 50 cents a piece, I think. But it's book two in book three of Batman the Cult from the 80s. It was a Jim Starlin prestige format, format square bound um, miniseries um, that came out. And a lot of people liked it. They were grabbing it left and right. You got to remember, this is also the time where uh, having a miniseries was still new and really cool and stuff. Right. But they got Bernie Wright there. And like I said, it got me because to me, Bernie Wrightson is horror and shadows and black and dark and all this stuff. And really didn't get that till towards the end of the story where we're down in the sewers and the rats are flying around, you know. So that's why I go back and forth with it. I don't hate it, but I'm just thinking it wasn't Bernie being Bernie. Now I'm old. Comics are expensive and I'm cheap. Yep. Ditto. Everybody's. Yep. We all are. That's, that's, that's all of us. I miss Burning. Hey, Knights of Old is on there. What's going on? Batman the Cult issue three has story pages out of order. Hardly anyone noticed. Hmm. Well, I want to have to say I'm probably one of those people that didn't notice either. Uh, I've only read it one time. I usually just flip through it with the artwork on that one. And I do read my comics. Let me put that out there. Reading the Cult now on book two. Awesome. The Cult was one of my faves. I was stoked when I finally got them all. Awesome, Tat. Now, Tat. Tat's comics, man. If he, he gets excited about something, he sticks with it and reads it. If I remember it right and stuff like that, it's usually good stuff. Now, here's the most expensive thing I bought at the at the con there, right? It was uh, for I had the hardback edition of Weapon X. Now, this was in Marvel. I had the full set of Marvel Comics Presents with the Barry Winsler Smith written, drawn, I think colored story. And it's the story of how Wolverine has Adam Antium in there. Okay. And he's... You know, he's a freaking savage through this whole thing, as you can see and stuff, right? Um, I had the hardback edition, and I sold it for some reason. I hit one of those spurts where I either needed money or I was looking around, and I was sick of the glut that I had. And I'm like, well, I don't really need this. I got the issues and all this stuff, right? Well, I got the collected edition, and I really like uh, how it's colored. It is softback. I do miss that hardback. Maybe I'll get on... Um, Maybe I'll get on eBay. I need to make sure I don't have it. But after I'm talking like this, I'm not even sure anymore. Uh, but I want to make sure I don't have it. I may go ahead and get that hardback edition again and stuff like that. But you know, this is, to me, this is going to be a reader copy and stuff. This was a great story. It was one of the things that made me come around to Barry Winsler Smith because I could not stand how he drew faces. It just threw me off. Anytime he drew faces, I'm like, we got this guy who you know, has great anatomy. Uh, he's got a unique um, palette for colors, if you will. Uh, he's really unique. Um, I, you know, I would see his stuff in Epic Illustrated on the covers every now and then and stuff like that. And then he did this book and I'm like, he's a phenomenal writer. I thought this was really sophisticated to be in Marvel Comics Presents, if you will, at the time, you know, and then he ended up getting a whole issue to, to finish it off with a double page spread. Uh, it was a really exciting time for Marvel Comics Presents when I did this Wolverine story. You were getting a piece of his origin finally that even he they told it in a way to where it's a standalone story. The reader's getting told but it wasn't being told to the characters or to Wolverine or anybody. We would know something he didn't know finally about himself. That was really cool back then. 
I saw you up here at the con yesterday. Didn't go, didn't get to stop and chat. We were both always talking with someone. Oh, Dennis, man, you should have come on up, man. I hate that. Um, I did see this Simply Incredible podcast dude that was there. I'm sorry for not remembering his name now. I uh, saw another YouTuber. Go check his stuff out. Barry Windsor Smith. I like those news, newsprint the best. I like those on newsprint the best. Yeah. Um, yeah. Barry Windsor Smith on his Valiant books were amazing. Yeah. He was fantastic on Solar and those two Unity books and stuff. And then he did his oversized Marvel you know, Treasury Edition uh, series of uh, storytellers. And I need to get the rest of those. Later in his career, his color palette was way too much purple and yellow. Both Prince and Deep Purple had to put tours on because Barry used up the purple in the Western Hemisphere. That's funny. Yeah, Conan was my favorite Barry Winsler Smith books. Yes, I have. Yeah, good stuff. All right, that's awesome. Okay, uh, some of the stuff, just some filling issues. But uh, this is just the side of America number 26. Uh, before this, you had JSA, and that's what it was called. Jeff Johns came on, made the book phenomenal. It was started by David S. Goyer and James Robinson. And then they kind of brought in Jeff Johns. This is the story. This is the book where I think he started becoming a rising star. He started bringing in uh, Black Adam into it and playing around with the, the Infinity Incorporated characters and stuff. And then all of a sudden, around 85, 86 or something like that, they just kind of canceled it. And they brought back a new number one with just the Society of America. And this was Jeff Johns' last issue. Of course, you see that's an Alex Ross cover. There's three that go with it. It's you connect all it's connected. You see all the characters together. Uh, I may I may finally this may I may have all three now. You know, that's why I got this one. Um, I have these original issues. OK, and I got these original issues. If I remember right, uh, I'd actually didn't buy them. I was in the hospital. My appendix was taken out. My appendix actually burst right when they got it out. They had it out and it actually burst while they were taking it out. And uh, all these people started bringing me comic books uh, while I was in the hospital. And one of the things that were in here, if I remember right, because uh, I still have a stack of them. I had a ton of action comics. And I got to remember on the newsstand uh, in, around Richland, around you know that town and stuff like that back then and stuff, they would keep comics for months on there. You know what I mean? It wasn't just the new comics of the month. So I've got tons of them. And I ended up getting, I think, if I remember right, I may be remembering this completely wrong, but I ended up getting the last two issues of uh, Superman Do the Crisis on Infinite Earth, where uh, Alan Moore closed the story, Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. And so I got a trade. It's a reader copy. And now that I'm thinking about this, I got this for a buck, which is good. It's, the recoloring in it is phenomenal. Um, cause you know, this was on the newsprint, the regular paper, if you will. And now we have a higher paper quality, uh, Kurt Swan being inked by George Perez. And then we got Swan, uh, Kurt Schaffenberger came on there and did the second part. This was in Superman in action right before John Byrne took over. And, uh, the story I always heard, and it may be in, in this book in here, I don't know, but the story I always heard is Alan Moore actually almost came across the table on like Julie Swartz or somebody said, I have to write that story. So you have the last Superman story uh, from the 80s. This thing is phenomenal. It's Alan Moore uh, being Alan Moore. And uh, to me, Alan Moore loves Superman. If there's any hero, I think he loves the Superman. You know, he, he knows the stuff. Probably that Silver Age Superman, too, is his love specifically. Uh, Barry Windsor Smith on Room was even good. I, yes, I love, I have his books. I can't get rid of his Room books. Um, just his, just his artwork. Uh, the, the whole, he, he blossomed to me. Windsor Smith is one of those guys who had, who he was able to blossom as he got older with his artwork. He just got better and better. Kevin Kelly, I'm doing fine, man. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Kurt Swan is my favorite Superman artist. Yep. Uh, that is one of my favorite Alan Moore stories. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm going to do an Alan Moore uh, video, you know, just to kind of talk about it. Now, Tim, the, Ander the Tim Anderson I talk about and stuff I go out there with, it was really amazing because I thought we were done. I went outside in the lobby. Uh, one of his buddies that he went to school with had met us there and we were going out to eat and stuff. And I was like, you know what? There's I know there's a table that I put some stuff to the side and I wanted to go back and look at it. Tim didn't want to go in there because and we'll call him Anderson. Anderson bought so many books that one of the guys just gave him a short box to carry it around instead of a bag. He bought that many comics. 
So we go in there and we're looking around and in a box that I'd already flipped through, he found the first thing he found was a variant edition of the max number one signed by Tom, Tom, uh, Sam Keith. And that variant edition would glow in the dark. So I joked around and I'm like, well, good for you. You got another one in there. And he went and he pulled this out. So for 50 cents, he got assigned Sam Keith max number one variant edition. And he was gracious enough to let me buy the number one, uh, regular edition signed by sam keith for 50 cents check that out now is that not worth hanging around with i love the max and i hope everybody has seen the uh cartoon that was on mtv back in the day it was fantastic all right we're about done guys you know so we had a moment there where i was actually joking with him so it was kind of funny but i whipped this out um, I bought this for, I think it was 50 cents. Pretty sure yeah, it's 50 cents. I think I got this for 50 cents. Okay. But if it wasn't 50 cents, it was a dollar, big deal. Right. So I get this book and this is of course uh, swamp thing number 50. This is the third or fourth ish copy of this I have. And this is one of those books I go off on because people try to say this is the first appearance of justice league dark. It's not, it's worth a lot. You know, people buy it for big money and Tim saw it and he just kind of opened his eyes and he was like, I just ended up buying that online for 10 bucks. And that was the cheapest one he could find. So I just kind of looked at it and I was like, it's my, this will be my third or fourth one. And I, and I joked around with them. I said, well, if I knew you needed it, I would have just sold it to you for nine fifty if you hadn't got the other one, you know, just joking around. But yeah, this is one of those books I buy all the time, not because of the freaking hype with it, but because this is just a fantastic uh, story that was going on in here. This is the culmination of crisis on infinite earth again that alan moore was just a genius he just went with it you know they were trying to try tie in all these books with uh crisis on infinite earth and he came up with i'm i'm it had to have been alan moore alan moore was like yeah sure i'll put out something in there with uh crisis and what he did is that uh basically the spiritual realm is what he's dealing with with the crisis but it's done in a way that you forget it's part of crisis you know what i mean uh, it's just genius that's why all these these characters pop up in there as they go on to a big spiritual war if you will yeah alan moore stuff is always good and then i got this and i want to i want to do something i'm gonna go through my comics and i got to do this soon because i'm going to try something for the first time i've never done i'm going to replace a staple that is starting to rust that's all that's really wrong with this that i can see right i'm not saying this is a mint copy but i really never thought i'd get this for some reason this book took off about a year or two ago i think and i'm always trying to collect all this you know teen titan stuff and i remember seeing this everywhere in dollar bins quarter bins 50 cent bins just never came around to get it i always thought it would be there it's an annual and it's the first appearance of vigilante from 1985 not the golden age vigilante but the judge who uh you know if somebody gets off the hook he goes and gets them their punisher if you will but He's a judge, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so it's Marv Wolf and George Perez cover and stuff, right? So I have the first appearance of the vigilante. No idea why this book started taking off in the last couple of years. Maybe it's got to do with people wanting to just get some keys finally. And I like these Millennium Editions, but apparently somewhere they had a vote. People got to vote on what books they would put in the Millennium Editions. And millennium Editions is where they look back in the 20th century to the most important books at DC, and they put a gold seal on it, and you'd get a reprint of it. Uh, but for some reason, this Brave and the Bold issue with uh, Batman and Green Arrow got it. And I'm wondering if this is the first time Neil Adams had these two together or something. I don't know. It's a Neil Adams cover. I learned to replace uh, Jared Oz, and what was it? Uh, what we got here? What was it you were going to say about the art size, 6 by 20, 10 by 15? I don't remember now. Um, I was ready to go there a little bit. And Jared Osmer says, I learned to replace staples as a kid. <laughs> That's funny. All right. And I got this just out of spite because I had this I have this book, but it's water damaged. And it really bothered me because I bought the book super cheap at um, a comic book convention in Dublin. I can't remember what, New River Valley comic-con and i got it really cheap and i got home and it was water damaged i don't usually get took like that you know what i mean i was very trusting that day let my guard down right so i went ahead and bought this for a buck it's the first appearance of speedball just to replace the one i have um so yeah it's uh, the amazing spider-man annual during the evolutionary war if you will number 22 from 1988 speedball the hero that was named after a drug that they don't think i don't think steve ditko realized you know <laughs> yes <Yeah, so. laughs> 
uh, I attend talking about classics like Swamp Thing, Whatever Happened to Man of Tomorrow, Barry Windsor Smith on Wolverine, Batman the Cult, makes me realize what a different place the comic book industry is in now. It's not nostalgia either, man. It's like this stuff, um, the quality of the books are anything like that, even if they were flawed or not as sophisticated, if you get what I'm saying and stuff. But, you know, it's made me realize Matt Bill Mantlo was, you know, a treasure, if you will. You know what I'm saying? Like, I get why people really are fans of his, you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm telling you, man, some of the books coming out now, and this isn't a slam. To me, this is a fact. Some of the books coming out right now, I've been really tempted to complete the new universe books, you know, uh, specifically Justice, uh, where Peter David came on with Lee Weeks. I saw a couple of those and I'm like, you know, I could finish this run out. You know what I mean? Uh, the new universe books are starting to look really good. And I was there with the new universe. You know, uh, I bought the new universe instead of some of these other books that could have been worth the money. I really missed the boat because I saved my money for the new universe. Monday is the final order cutoff for Batman 232 facsimile edition. Interesting. I think I've already, I might already have that ordered. I'll look, I'll look. Um, I had my stuff through Gmart. I might already have that ordered. Spider Gwen, Ghost Spider Sucks. I tried to like it. Finished out volume two. I want to go back to the old days. I just did a video last week or a live show. I think it was last week, Kevin Kelly. And I'm telling you, man, it's almost like the comic book industry, the comic book hobby, if you will. If it was an entity, took care of itself for us. And for now, going way back. You had the glut of comics coming out in the 80s and 90s with high print runs and things like that. And I'm telling you, man, more and more people that I'm seeing are turning into these back issues and they're trying out stuff they wanted or they're backing up. They're completing things. I mean, Absolute Carnage is the one that I talk about. That was a freaking mess when it came out and people hated it. And there's people who are collecting it. They're completing books like Dazzler for the last few years. ROM is a big one. People are going back and I'm telling you, the hobby took care of itself. These glut of books and they're cheap. These people are getting better quality stories, even though they were written 30 some years ago for you know 50 cents a buck a piece, two dollars, and they're getting big runs and stuff. The you know, you got the comic book industry, then you have the comic book hobby, and the hobby is doing well thanks to the back issues and stuff. There's a few people trying to get out of it, some stores are hurting. Or if they're not already gone, whatever. Uh, you know, you can talk about that stuff all day long, but you go to these comic book conventions and stuff like that, and uh, you know, back issues are 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 what what it is right now. I think nobody here in the states has heard of it yet, but the book uh, Kong Cruise, the best new series I've read in twenty years, is that the one you ordered and told me about? And I said I wanted to get it from France. Um. Man, I bought into the new universe series for Marvels. I bought more of Justice and Night Mask. I've got the Night Mask issue over there where Justice popped up and Keith Giffen did it. I love Starbrand. I like DP7. I had paid their name. I mean, I liked those, most of those books. You know, um, I wish Night Mask had been better. And it was real interesting to find out that part of their downfall was the money getting taken away. I don't, I'm assuming it was money for talent or whatever. I, I don't know the ins and outs of. How come to me and Jared's out there? I'm glad he's out there. But to me, a comic book all starts with this. You know, I, I saw a quote by Neil Adams where he said, "There's a hundred thousand dollar movie that starts right here in your hand." So I don't get how writing a good story and having somebody draw out the story, how having the money taken away affects that. So apparently, you know, the business side of it is what killed the universe before it even started. I guess I don't know. I don't know. Um, that's never really been, I've heard, I've read many articles and I've seen Jim Shooter finally talk about it a little bit. I got books to show, man. I'm getting on here. I mean, I bought, uh, see, it's all pretty much all art and minimum story. I'm not buying much new DC, uh, not got my money since 2016. I'm more forgiving of DC, uh, than I am of Marvel. I'll go ahead and tell you that. Um, Merc was good. Yeah, that was, I think that was a, that had some uh, really great Mike Zek covers uh, that were definitely of the era. Uh, okay. Yeah, Merc was like a Vietnam vet that was a mercenary. Was okay. Sci Force was good. Sci Force was Forever People. When I read Sci Force, I'm like, I'm reading a real life version of Forever People, is what it reminded me of. Because they would all come together and make the Sci Hawk, and the Forever People would come together and make the Infinity Man. I bought a great French book last month, The Living Death. It adapts a German Gothic sci-fi novel. Oh, that sounds cool. Oh, that's awesome. Everybody read Paulo Costa's comment right now. That is awesome. 
By the way, there was an animated Usagi Yojimbo series in the works. I've heard about that. I've heard about that. And then Ponadidas. Hey, Ponadidas is out there. Cool. Dark Hawk was great. My brother had that series. He loved Dark Hawk. And it's blowing my mind because there are still lovers of Dark Hawk out there. All right. Uh, I found an early issue of Why the Last Man, number three. I think eventually I will find a number one that I can afford. But uh, I'm finding this series all over the place. And uh, I'm by pure accident. I mean, I kind of bought some of these because of a cool cover. Just one or two covers I'll always keep. Then I got them because they were on the cheap. I think this was 50 cents, I think. I don't know. Uh, they're all looking like they're 50 cents, but I swear some of these were a dollar. Uh, but, you know, I grabbed this one and uh, it's number three. It's a low number. I mean, I don't know how many. I think I have like maybe 20 issues of this series without even trying. Uh, I'm in the um, some of the trades like on two bucks a piece, 250 or something like that. I'm glad I document these in videos and stuff. So I'm going for it. Why the Last Man is kind of fun, but it was balanced. You know what I mean? Like there are there is man bashing going on in this, but some of the people will counteract them. The one I, the one there's one comic I find fascinating where it took place in like a church, and these these women hate the uh, Catholic Church, and they got into the patriarchy and all this stuff. And then the other lady countered it with like, what about the Magdalene uh, nurseries or something like that uh, for women? They would the nuns ran them. They would bring in women that they were like, uh, you know, taking care of. They were on the run for their husbands for being beat or they were destitute or something. And they pretty much put them in sweatshops and worked them to death for nothing, you know, and stuff like that. So that's what I mean. This is balanced. That's why I liked it. Uh, you don't get a lot of that anymore when these subjects are brought up. Instead of trying to convince you, you know, what they do is they try to convince you nowadays instead of just showing you the big picture and letting you make up your own mind. Uh, here's another two books that I'm just going to go keep because I bought these off the newsstand, sold them, got them again, sold them in a bag, got them again, probably put them in like a, probably, you know, sold them at some little convention that I sold at in the 2000s, you know, they on and on. So I'm going to keep these, but it's the Punisher War Journal. Uh, issues by Jim Lee, where we have the Punisher and Wolverine going at it, you know, going back in the day, number uh, six and seven. Punisher War Journal. Yeah. Jim Lee hitting it on there. Great stuff. Great nostalgia. But this was huge when they announced this. This is when it was still rare to have, you know, guest stars in these books and stuff like that and little crosswords. I'm much impressed by the majority of the European books right now. 99% of the stuff published here. Uh, more than 99% of the stuff published here in the U.S. Scott Connor talking to Paulo there. Yeah, I could talk about that all day, man. Um, Tardy. Tardy is, is Tardy and Mobius uh, right now. Those are the guys top of my list uh, for European works. Um, to me, getting back, getting into that European stuff and going back to my heavy metal days, it's like uh, there's parts of it like I'm brand new to the hobby, and I love that. Uh, Apollo says, same here, Scott. When I was young, I bought Portuguese language editions of U.S. comics and read French comics in the library. Now I've switched. That's awesome. What do we got here? Was that it? I think that might be it. Back on that flew by. Like I said, guys, I might do a video where I just show the books or something. How long? We've been on here an hour and 12 minutes. That's pretty cool. Um, I don't feel tardy. That's funny. We got a, we got a Van Halen, David Lee Roth. Uh, that's funny. Nice, nice. All right, guys. Well, thanks for everybody that's been here. Uh, thanks for everybody that stuck around. We got some high numbers for my channel, which is fantastic. Do you have any any issues of Batman, Batman Noir? Uh, no, I do not. But Ollie's actually has some of the uh, a hardback, I think, which is Batman Noir uh, on sale. I'll check it out make sure that's what I'm talking about. Um, you know, right now, uh, the Batman stuff, um, I'm really wanting to complete my long Halloween again and uh, things like that. I'm backing up on certain stories of Batman that I want to get and stuff. I mean, I still have my Batman stuff. Don't get me wrong, but you know, um, I, we're going to end up going on a rant about comic books today. You know, so, you know, Tom, the Tom King stuff. I'm like, you know, he's working out his therapy through Batman instead of actually writing Batman stories. Uh, I got the Kirby Devil Dinosaur book from Ollie's a few days ago. That's fantastic. There's um, Harrisonburg. There's an Ollie's in Harrisonburg that I might stop at on my next road trip for work that I might pick that up. I think I have all the Kirby issues of that anyway. 
great underrated book. It felt weird when I read an issue or two when I was a kid, you know, but now I'm like, it was just ahead of its time, like 2001 by Kirby. Uh, great topics, bro, in your collection. The books are amazing. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Tat. I'm trying to finish Dark Victory. Dark Victory was cool, but I like Long Halloween better. I think Dark Victory on its own is great, but it's pretty bad when it um, you have to compare the two even if it's a sequel to Long Halloween. All right, guys, I'm losing the light out here. I'm actually seeing a sunset at 8.09, which means uh, summer is really starting to fade away now. Because, uh, you know, out here the sunsets have been hitting at like nine o'clock and after. Oh, man, 2001 would be an awesome in an artist edition format. Yes, it would. And it should have been. I think I have the treasury edition of that. Uh, that's as close as we get there. Uh, finally caught a live stream. I found another expensive hobby, namely vintage hoard paperbacks. It's funny you should say that. Some of the things I haven't shown you guys are the records I've been buying, some Blood Zeppelin records I've been finding cheap and all stuff. Thanks for your time, Tim. I got a jet. Thanks, Kevin. You have a good one, brother. You got a good one. But uh, some paperbacks. I finally finished the book It. I actually thought about doing a review of the book It, like we're in sixth grade and I was going to do a book report. Uh, it's still over here. Tats Comics, it's still over here in Oregon. Hot. Yeah, it's it's been hot here. We've been hitting, we've been getting some high temperatures up here for where I'm at, which is fine. All right, guys. Okay, guys, like I said, tweet this out. Subscribe. Thumbs it up. Put it on Twitter. Get it out there. We need to let people know there's still somebody and other people out here that still talk about comic books and not, you know, it's, it's you know, you know, we stray off a little bit and stuff, but it always comes back to the comics. He had all over the, yeah, he it all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kevin, everything's kind of going good. Um, the fiance is in the rest and stuff after our ER visit day and stuff. So it's going to be good. All right. You have a good one. Everybody's got to take off. So uh, thanks a lot guys and catch you later. Everybody, uh, everybody be good. Excellent to each other. Oh, wait a minute. In the 80s, there was a boom of horror novels by Stephen King and like in, in comics. There was even a bubble bursting for the genre early 90s. Interesting. Good to see you too, Gene Paul Ace Peter. All right. Later, guys. For real this time. Bye.